Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up for this session. Uh, my name is Neil Thompson. No, that's not a typo, unfortunately. That's how my parents chose to spell it. Um, I'm a container specialist at AWS, which means I spend most of my time dealing with Kubernetes, but I've also got a chance to work a lot with Backstage over the last couple of years. You will see my name over a lot of the AWS plugins uh, that are in GitHub. Um, and I'm here to talk about everyone's favorite topic right now, which is Gen AI. So if you had told me that my name was going to be on a slide about Gen AI a year ago, I wouldn't have believed you. But uh, I'm starting to come around a little bit. Um, now, the talk that Ben Wilcock did a little earlier, I think, gave us really good context on industry direction here. So if you didn't catch that, go back and watch the recording. But overall, I'm not here to kind of convince you that you should be using Gen AI. I think what I want to focus on is patterns that we are seeing in practice today the platform teams are using and just reflect what, what we're seeing. I'm not here to give an opinion, an opinion one way or the other. Um, the Dora report, as a couple of people have already brought up, is a good source of data here. There's some positives that they're seeing. There's some challenges, as with everything, but I definitely recommend you take a look at that report. They have an AI section this year in the Dora report, so it's definitely getting a lot more attention as we see the shift happening. I have 25 minutes. Uh, I can't do an LLM 101 in this uh, session, so uh, if you're a bit behind on the tech, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, I'm going to be able to catch you up here. The takeaway here is really just that you know, LLMs are using that massive scale of data that they're being trained on to solve a bunch of problems across all sorts of industries, right? It's not just us in the tech industry, financial industry, the healthcare. Everyone's taking a look at how they can leverage this for innovation, for productivity, you name it. Um, and personally, I've been using it in, in my work, right? So using code generation in my IDE, getting it to review content that I write to make sure I haven't made mistakes. I'm personally finding productivity benefits from, from this tech, so it's unsurprising that so many people are trying to put it to work. Oh, like it is. So uh, from a use case perspective, I, I really want to focus on platform engineering, right? So we're not going to be talking about code generation today. Uh, I don't think that's really that relevant to this particular audience. It's relevant, but not what I want to spend the time on. Instead, I want to take a look at use cases like this, which we're seeing more platform teams interested in, right? So uh, the first one being enablement, right? Helping developers solve situations or scenarios that they are faced with without having to troll through the internet's swath of documentation, uh, plus all of their own internal documentation as well. It can, it can take a while to figure out how to solve any given situation. We want to help them get to an answer quicker. Uh, the other one that we're seeing a lot of is, is issue resolution. So you have a problem. Maybe it's operational, security, uh, cost optimization. Um, we want to help our teams identify and remediate these issues uh, as fast as we can. And I think these are just a couple of the ones that we're seeing recurring across some of the platform teams we talk to. Um, this blog post is not specific to Backstage, but it does cover a collaboration between AWS and BMW, which is in the use case area that we're talking about here. Um, they were looking to expose out capabilities to their developers to do things like uh, get feedback on AWS best practices, to get a health report of their cloud accounts, and then drive targeted issue resolution based on that health report. So if you're interested in looking at how they architected this, dive more in the use cases, please take a look at the blog post. Uh, but I think it's, it's a good example just from a high level of some of the use cases we're seeing some of, uh, some of the platform teams take a look at. Now, when it comes to Gen AI and Backstage specifically, which is why we're here, what, what exactly is Backstage going to give us for these use cases? So I want to break this down into three main areas. The first one is the catalog that Backstage gives us, provides us with that huge set of information on workloads, users, developers, teams, and more importantly, we get a whole graph of relationships if we've built our catalog correctly on how all those entities relate to each other. And that potentially gives a, a, a ton of information to these models. Uh, the second one is the plugins, right? Those platform integrations that we get from all the work the community has been doing over the years to integrate with all the stuff in our platform, and we'll talk a bit more about that later, but that's another source of information and hooks into our platform that these models can start to use. And finally, um, maybe the most straightforward one, developers should already be in your portal, right? Hopefully every day, maybe not, but hopefully frequently enough that it makes sense as the place that we start to build out or at least surface this stuff to developers for the use cases that we're talking about. 
Now, Ben Wilcock touched on the subject again last year, uh, where he introduced his plugin Backchat. So this was a, a really you know, great way to get the Backstage community started with GenAI, embedding existing GenAI projects right into the interface. And it let us start experimenting with this tech in our developer portal. Um, he also touched on a lot of things like considerations for LLMs, which I don't have time to do. Again, I want to get to the fun stuff. So uh, definitely recommend taking a look at that talk, playing around with the plugin, uh, something that's, I think, worth your time. But overall, I think the direction that we're seeing is that if we want to get more of that value out of Backstage that we saw in the previous slide, we need something that's a bit more native and of an experience. And that's something that we're seeing more teams start to, start to play with now. So what I want to do is take a really quick journey through maybe how an organization might start to build out these Gen AI capabilities in Backstage. Um, and unsurprisingly, we see most people start with a chat assistant, right? It's what you see in every Gen AI blog post and GitHub repository is how to build one of these chatbots. It's, it's kind of what you associate with Gen AI, right? So it's, it's where we're seeing a lot of people start. Um, and you've obviously got a ton of inspiration on how to build that, making it real and backstage at a super high level. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? We would have a front end plugin that's exposing out our chat interface that receives the user prompts, forwards them to a back end plugin. The back end plugin may add things like uh, system prompt. So maybe we can start to craft how the model responds to our user queries. Maybe we add the user's identity, the, the teams they're a part of that gives us some basic context above just the LLM's base training data. And then once all of that prompt is sent off to the LLM, the response is sent back to the user and we have a basic chat assistant. Now there's a bunch of stuff you need to deal with here around memory for agents and, and storing uh, persisting chats and all that sort of stuff, which we won't dig into, but at a high level, this is what we're looking at for the discussion that we're having uh, through this session. Now, what I want to do is look at a scenario for how would a user actually use this to solve a problem, because that's, ultimately that's what we want. So we're going to use this prototype backstage plugin I had lying around because we're going we're to hack on it a little bit, uh, or rather I already have, uh, to, to show how we can start to evolve this approach. And all we're really doing here is something you might expect to see in backstage, right? I can see security misconfigurations or vulnerabilities for a workload that's in the Entity View tab um, that I should be remediating as the owner of that workload. Um, the results are contextual, and we're pulling those back from, from an API, so there's a back-end plugin doing the work for us here. But this could be whatever plugin that you're, you're, looking to, you're looking to integrate with that gives you the data that you want. Our task for this situation is to resolve the, the big red text error that we have here, which is the ultimate sin of not using a read-only file system for our containers, uh, which isn't that bad, but best practices for containers uh, means that for this particular workload we're running Kubernetes, we should be using a read-only file system. It's best practice and our security tool has fed this back as something we should, we should probably fix. So the basic architecture that we put in place gives us some, a pretty good start, right? Some foundational capabilities. We can rely on the general knowledge of the, the model to give us pretty good answers to, to questions. Uh, we can use that context to start to customize the responses a little bit to, to how our organization wants to behave. Um, but as we break this down, maybe we get a bit more insight into some of the issues. So um, the first one is the, the question. So for those that can't read that, the question is essentially, how can I configure a Kubernetes pod to use a read-only file system? So we've taken our finding, we've translated that into a question, and we've given it to, to the model through the chat assistant. But that already has required some work by the user to context switch to our chat assistant to craft their prompt, which is surprisingly difficult to do well. It's got a name, prompt engineering. Um, and that, that takes a, a little while to get used to, especially when you're looking at more complicated situations. It, it's, it's, it can be hard to get right. Uh, we've also lost a lot of the context that we had on the entity view page, right? The, the, the relationship graph, the CICD system, like all, all the other things about the finding are gone. We're just asking this very targeted question. Um, and the worst part is we copied and pasted this basically from somewhere else in the same user interface, which is, is, is pretty atrocious. And, and don't get me wrong, I've done pretty well by copying and pasting stuff over the last 10 years, but I don't think it's really what we're, we're trying to do here. Uh, when we come to the answer, the answer is not wrong. It, if you applied this to a Kubernetes manifest, it would probably fix your problem. Um, but in our fictional scenario here, our platform team, as many have, have given their developers a custom Helm chart. So although this answer is right, I can't use it. I need, I need an answer for my Helm chart for the organization that I'm in. So right answers are not what we want. We want actionable answers, and, and that's what matters. And, and that means that I can't do much with this. 
Now, there's lots of ways to customize model behavior. And one thing that I did want to call out as prior art as well is, is Rodi's RAG AI plugin. I don't have time to dwell on this, but they looked at applying retrieval augmented generation or RAG to customizing uh, a model with, say, the contents of your backstage catalog or your, your tech docs, for example. Um, definitely worth checking out. We'll be taking a slightly different approach in, in something that we look at a bit later, but it's definitely something we're seeing commonly used is, is applying RAG to these chat assistants. Um, but earlier, and I think Ben, I'm going to steal this from, from your talk, he, he talked about the concept of a nexus system, which I think accidentally this diagram kind of conveys, um, where Backstage is talking to all these systems through those plugins. We're talking to CICD, we're talking to our source control, we're talking to cost optimization, incident management. Obviously, your mileage may vary depending on what you've integrated to, but what if we could use not just the catalog, the tech docs, but hook into the actual plugins that we have already and just make those available to the model to use directly. That would give us a whole bunch of capabilities with a very little amount of work. So the, the mechanism that we want to play with here is, is something called tool use or function calling. So this is something we've been exploring. Um, now this is something which we've seen some platform teams use. This isn't something that everyone's using. It's definitely something that's a bit more uh, on the advanced side than, than, than RAG um, or upfront RAG as I would maybe call it. And the idea here is that Instead of us doing an upfront search, as you tend to do with RAG, and then injecting the result into the context before you send it to the model, we are going to add what we call tool definitions into the prompt that we send along with the user prompt to let the model know that we can do stuff for it, right? We can call APIs, um, we can perform searches, and then the model itself is actually gonna decide what it needs and then respond asking us to do those functions, perform those functions for it. And that way, it's taking a little bit more of that responsibility for creating a plan of action, maybe using a, an approach like chain of thought, where it breaks down its task into multiple steps, and then it will iterate through the tools that we have until it decides that it's at an answer, and then we return that to, to the user. Um, and this can be exceptionally powerful. Uh, it starts to break into that idea of AI agents, where they're showing some level of agency in terms of how they solve a problem. Um, and you can do some, some pretty interesting things with this, although I will say that tool use is only supported by certain models. Um, things like Llama, for example, Claude, OpenAI. There's plenty of models that do support it, but you just have to be careful to make sure that your model is, is capable of doing it. And so if we evolve our plugin, this is kind of more of what we look like. It's, it's a bit more complicated. So we'll, we'll start to refer to our backend plugin as having something called an agent. And then we're gonna to start to model those tool definitions based on our existing plugins. So we're essentially wrapping the plugins as tools and then telling the model that if it needs us to call a plugin, then we can do it for it. Just let us know as you go through your planning process and then we can do that. So that immediately allows us to create the catalog. It lets us um, retrieve Kubernetes pod information from the Kubernetes plugin. Um, we can use our prototype security hub plugin to get our security findings and this, starts to allow you to not just build these integrations separately, but actually leverage all the investment the community's made in these plugins over the years, and then we just make them available to, to the models. Now, I will say, we see a lot of uh, platform teams building this agent-type process, but outside of Backstage. This is not the only way to do it. This is something we're exploring, seeing how viable it is, um, but it's giving some, some kind of interesting results. So, uh, I'm gonna, take a risk and do a, a live demo of generative AI. Um, I'm sure it'll turn out fine. Uh, I recorded a video, but I decided we're just, we're just gonna do it. So um, I'll, let's see if we can make this text a little bit more. You're probably still not gonna be able to read it, so I'll just try to, especially for the folks up the back, read out kind of what's going on here. So um, at this point, we're in kind of like a simple, just backstage demo setup. We have a catalog with some workloads, a bunch of teams on them. Um, if we go into one of our, our workloads here, we've configured a bunch of plugins already. We have CICD uh, plugged into our pipelines. Kubernetes has got pods information. We've set up some basic catalog relationships so we know some stuff relies on some other stuff. Um, and we have our, our security hub plugin. So this is just that prototype one that I had lying on the shelf, which I could, I could change easily. And we can see here that we have our, we have our findings. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to our chat assistant here. And at this point, we've implemented that architecture that we saw in, in the previous slide. So we've added some plugins to, to the agent. So what I'm gonna do here now is I'm gonna take a modified version of our prompt, which is quite different to what we saw before, right? We're gonna ask it 
to identify the high-level security findings and tell me how to remediate them, um, as well as exp tell me why they're a problem, right? So give me some extra context other than what I've just got in the UI. So what is going to happen now is the, the model is going to go away, formulate its plan of action, and it's going to start using the tools that we made available to it. Now, for the purposes of this demo specifically, I've added this little uh, dialog box here, which we could dig into in a second, but we can see what tools it decided to use. But let's take a look at the response first. So um, we can see a couple of things immediately. So first thing, it's obviously aware of the catalog because I get a nice little link to my entity. So we, I've, I've, pr I've configured this prompt so that it will dynamically link me to anything that, that I look up. So that's, that's quite helpful. Um, the second thing is it's, it's answered our question. It's given me the risk of this security finding. Um, and it's modified its, its answer. So um, it specifically told me that I need to use Helm because we're using a Helm chart. Um, and then it's actually gone away and searched my internal documentation with a query based on the finding that it found first to answer my question based on our internal documentation. So what that looks like under the covers is you'll see first it looked up, I've told it to always check the catalog for an entity first. So it goes away and actually just uses the catalog API to grab the full context for our payment API component. Then it goes away and uses our pre existing I didn't modify the backend plugin at all for this. I just, I, it happened that the, the backend plugin gave me the information I needed with the, the API signature I wanted. So I just pass it the, the entity. Plugins like Jenkins work similarly to this. That meant it fetched the security findings live from the API. This is not using some, uh, the, an intermediary to store the findings. They came straight from the source. And then it did, what you can do in RAG ahead of time based on the user's prompt, but this is, this is not a prompt that I, I, I sent it. So the prompt that it, 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 or the query rather, that it sent to my knowledge base is, how do you configure a read-only file system in Kubernetes? Which means that it used the output from the second step, which was the high, it found the high severity security finding out of all the lists that I had, and then it was able to pull out the context and understand that it had to solve that problem. And then it queried the knowledge base. If we use something like upfront RAG, it would have sent that whole question or a variation of my original question to RAG, and that m might not have given us what we were looking for. It probably wouldn't have, because my Helm documentation doesn't talk about high severity security hub findings, just how to configure your Helm chart. So you can already see that this is already starting to take a lot more agency in how it solves our, our problems. It's using backstage plugins to solve uh, how all this fits together. Um, and it, it just unlocks a whole bunch of sort of flexible use cases where we can piggyback on top of the investments in those plugins to, to solve uh, multi-step problems potentially for our users. Um, the other nice thing that these uh, models can do is perform actions for us because at the end of the day, a tool is just an API call. So I'm now going to ask it to create a GitHub issue for the finding. Uh, we're, we're now starting to leverage the fact that we're in a conversational context. So I'm just going to say, make a, secure, a GitHub issue for that finding um, on my GitHub repository. Uh, give it a title, 10 words. And because we love our developers, we're going we're to get it to write a poem um, for, for, the, for the issue finding there. So nothing too different here. Um, the one thing to note is it knows what GitHub repository to use because it's on the entity. I've already told that. To, to backstage because if I was using the, the backstage, uh, sorry, the GitHub plugins that already exist, I've probably already added that annotation if I want a link to the source, for example. So it's gone off, created an issue. We can see first it called my GitHub issue tool because it figured that out, but it's done pretty much nothing else. So it's not linear. Um, and if we open up this issue here, then we'll see that, uh, let's see how creative it got. It has written what it's called security haiku um, and Still give us the answer, it's just a little prettier than uh, just outlining it there. So I'm hoping our, uh, our developers appreciate that. Um, so I think this is already massively improved on what we had before, right? Not only can we make this a bit more uh, seamless for our developers to use based on what the feedback they're getting through existing plugins or other systems, um, but we can start to take actions and solve these flows in, in multi-step processes. Um, but one thing we've seen from a few platform teams is that they start with a chat assistant and they, they find that maybe that, that isn't quite giving them what they want. And part of the problem with that is going back to that issue we talked about before. I still had to know what to ask it, I had to know how to ask it, and I still had to do some prompt engineering. So maybe there's ways that we can, we can sort of work around that. If we go back to uh, our 
plugin here, you'll notice this actually differs from the screenshot in the slides already. I've added this, this help button, which is why I chose this plugin so I could start. Uh, I wasn't really in the mood to fork something. Um, if we click this help button, this will now open up a more targeted flow, right? So this is sort of illustrating the platform team behind the scenes have created a dedicated agent for this task. Oh, has this come out? back where we are, uh, the platform teams created a dedicated agent for this task, right, so for our security hub findings. Um, they've gone away, they've crafted a prompt specific for this problem, they've given it access to just the tools that it needs, and it also provides the, the, the findings in a lot more of a structured way, right? Sometimes we've heard feedback from folks we've, we've shown some of the stuff to, which is, it's just given me a wall of text. I've still got to parse out all the things that I need to do. So this is very similar to things like you might see, for example, in the AWS console. So we've started adding this to some of our console screens, where we will give you a troubleshoot with Amazon Q button, where it will present you with something very similar to this and it starts to get you to the problem a little, a little more straightforward. It's giving you the same answer, um, the same customized answer. It's still using all the same sources. It's just a lot more targeted to what you're trying to do um, and it potentially allows you to just get to the answer quicker. And obviously we could add in, I've just added a close button down here. We could add in, create a GitHub issue straight off the back of this. We could maybe even, the future might just be fix my problem for me which I would have loved to have had for this demo, but I didn't quite have time to put the pieces together. But that would start to show you how you can start to use these separate AI agents in different systems designed for different purposes, and they start to flow together to start to really drive productivity in terms of how your developers and platform teams can solve these problems. Okay, well, we made it through, and the Gen AI did not let me down, so I'll Chalk that up as a victory. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, uh, applying this is still in the early days, right? We're, we're not by any means seeing a ton of platform teams start to, start to leverage this stuff, but it, but it is happening and it's in production. And I think as a community, it's, it's useful for us to start discussing how we can, how we can gain from, from applying this technology for, our, for the use cases that matter for us. And Backstage, I think, offers a really good spot, as we've seen, to quickly build out capabilities because of all the hard work that's been done on Backstage. Um, quickly and, and effectively. So in general, I think some of the principles we're starting to see, pretty high level, but as with many things, start simple, evolve from there, find the use cases that matter. Again, to pick up on something that the, the, the Dora report mentioned is, is understanding the good and the bad of these AI systems and figuring out the use cases that are gonna make sense to you. And I think that's obviously the first thing that just can't be understated. Secondly, customizing the prompt, or sorry, the, customizing the model is obviously going to show you significantly better returns. I think as we demonstrate in person today, whether it's RAG, fine tuning, tool use, a combination, um, it's definitely something that, you know, understanding how those mechanisms work and how you can apply them, there's lots of different ways you can, is going to give you a lot more bang for your buck. Um, and finally, you don't have to overdo it on the chat stuff, right? Like, get, get started. It's also great for experimenting. I use that to figure out, like, quick feedback on the prompts that I'm using and, and figuring out what will work. Um, but there's other ways to surface this, surf, sorry, surface this to your, your users, which might end up actually being a better use of your investment here. So just take those into account when you're, when you're looking at this stuff. Um, we will be open sourcing the plugin that I was showing today, um, which will give you some ba a basic framework for, for maybe putting into place or playing with what we looked at today. Um, it will give you the chat, that basic chat assistant, uh, an API for building that guided, that more guided experience, and it is uh, super modular. We have, I've built implementations for this. It uses the module and the extension system in Backstage. You can implement agent in LangGraph, LangChain, uh, you can write it yourself, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's open, it doesn't make any assumptions there. I've been using LangGraph for this demo, uh, but you can do whatever you want. Um, and you can also add those tools in as extension point. There's an extension point for the tools. So you can add tools dynamically using backstage modules and add your own tools or implement wrap backstage plugins, whatever you want to do. So um, that QR code is a link to a GitHub issue, which you can use to, to respond to or whatever you want to do to see when we, we publish this, but we're hoping to have that out um, relatively soon and hopefully folks can start playing with it. Um, 
Overall, I'd love to chat to anyone that is looking at this stuff. I obviously find this super interesting. I think there's lots of great stuff that we could potentially do here. So if you're, if you're working on this stuff, then uh, hit me up somewhere, either here at the event or on one of those channels. But in general, thank you so much for your time, and I hope this was useful. Can, okay, so um, seeing this made me obviously think of a bunch of possibilities. I guess first question, with your GitHub issues, um, is that using the scaffolder at all? Or is that? No, so one thing, that the scaffolder is something that we can do, right? So I was digging into the API for that. I wanted to have that working, I just didn't have the time. But we've, we've seen folks build the scaffolder into these flows as well. So that is, using the scaffolder, we could do, that was just using a, a simple tool that I made uh, you could go either way. Gotcha. And then the second question is, have you looked into like the permission system in regards to this? Like, obviously you might not want to expose full context for a specific person, right? Yeah, so what we actually, what, well, the approach that I took was actually, if you look at like, this is a simple tool, so I didn't quite have the time to, to show this, but the tools are pretty straightforward, right? So this is just like, 50 lines of JavaScript, well, 50 lines of JavaScript. Um, you can see here, we've got the definition of the tool, which is the schema. So I told it, what parameters do I need from, or what parameters does the model need to give me? The name, the description, so it knows what to use the tool for. And then you just implement the function. So this is the catalog one, it's very simple. There's probably, this probably needs to be much more complicated. Um, but you can see here that like, we've passed through the backstage credentials in our implementation, that the one I've been playing with, so that, if your plugins, for example, the Security Hub one, the Jenkins one, rely on using an entity and then looking that up, if you don't have access to the catalog entity, it's actually gonna tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. So we can start, that's another benefit that I think is useful here is if we wire this stuff through correctly, RBAC for Gen AI can be a problem, right? If you've just loaded a bunch of docs into an S3 bucket and you're indexing those, how do you know what people should be able to see? Your wiki permissions might get lost. This means that as long as we gate the plugins correctly, and the, the, it's, it's propagated through, then we, this, you can start to do this. It's something that I want to prove would work, but it, it will, so we, we can start to think about that as long as we plan appropriately. Hi, um, so we have integrated, uh, well, we have two POCs using LLMs for Backstage, one of which has a RAG component and we're capable of reading in from the catalog we can read in from some wiki pages, but what we really need is to help users understand observability information. So we're bringing in synthetics into Backstage. So if I'm understanding what you are presenting, it can in understand sort of actions that need to be taken. So if a synthetic is failing, you could say, why is it failing? Um, I'm just trying to make sure my understanding of what you presented is yeah. correct. So there is one uh, scenario that I have where it's a very simple version of that, but it's why is my, why are my Kubernetes pods broken, right? All that does is offload to the existing Kubernetes extension plugin, um, and it is smart enough, I say smart, it's not smart, right? But it, it, it's able to figure out enough that it goes off, calls the plugin for the, the pod information, retrieves the logs from the pods, and then takes a look at the logs, and, and the demo of that I've got, I've typoed my health check and actually spell checks me and corrects me and says that you, you spelled this wrong. Um, but if we take that and extend it out, there's no reason why we couldn't plug this into a Prometheus tracing, and then as long as you sort of give the model enough of a lesson in what it should be finding there and how to process it and factor it into a troubleshooting situation, troubleshooting I think is definitely a, a, a use case for sure here. Now obviously observability vendors are also gonna start, they have already started looking at this stuff, but if you're going more the open source route, um, maybe there's, there's, a, there's something here that, that could be built on where you're, you're building on those, whatever data source you can get in and teach it to use, it can, you know, the LLMs can, you can, you can try it out and see the, effect of, the, the effectiveness is probably the way I would phrase it. Thank you. So my team is struggling to understand the difference between, you know, the common community plugins that AWS provides and then also the Harmonix branded. Uh, so with this plugin that you're looking to roll out, is it going to be in both places or what kind of guidance would you give us? Uh, yeah, so the way that I think about like the Harmonix versus like the, the AWS plugins is that the, the way that we designed the AWS 
GitHub repository plugins, the community plugins, is that they're, they tend to be like very granular, composable, service-aligned plugins that you can just throw into a, a backstage that you have and they'll just work and then we'll try to keep them up to date and add features. Harmonix is more of like a packaged sort of like approach, right, where they've got opinions baked in around not just the portal, but like the platform mechanics underneath there, which means that it might be good to get you up and running if you've not got anything there existing, um, but the, the plugins and the other repository are more, you have your backstage you've been using for a year, just install these as normal backstage plugins and you can you know, use them as you need to more selectively. So, so we would plan, plan to put that plugin in the community okay. repository. Thanks. And if Harmonix wanted to leverage that, they could. Uh, yeah, howdy. Uh, so I think it was a really cool example. Um, it showcased a lot of capabilities. But as I look at that example and I start thinking uh, to say maybe a more productionized system, a more dynamic productionized system, uh, I start to wonder, uh, we'll take it as an example, you had a security context, right? But what if that security context came from a mutating webhook, be your sidecar, vault operator, whatever. At what point does the, if any, do you think that this kind of agent approach or the, the plugin starts to struggle with the way more dynamic nature of a production environment? Because, you know, reading a single YAML is easy. Reading changing YAML is quite a different feat. For sure. Uh, and I, it's a good question. I think that part of my response to that is going to be, I mean, at the end of the day, these models are going to be as good as the data that they're given, right? So part of my answer is going to be, like, I use Security Hub as my example there. Um, Security Hub needs to be aware of that too, right? Security Hub, if Security Hub's not supposed to flag your sidecar, that shouldn't have been there in the first place. So it should never have got to the mo like the model should never have had to process it, right? So I think a large part of this problem is is going to be making sure that the data that gets into it is 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 accurate. And I think if you're struggling with that with the models, you're probably going to be struggling with it already. Um, and we probably need to, to help with that. But the other part of that is going to be uh, I think it, it's something that it, it's going to show itself in time as to how effective the models get with more, more dynamicism, more, more complexity. Um, I'm not sure that I have an answer, like ultimate answer of whether they're going to be handled all, all these complex examples, but I think it's a case of like making sure that the, we're taking into account the areas of responsibility of these architectures in general of where does the data go, where the intermediate data stores, the master it, and making sure that data is, is accurate and useful to the model. And then we'll be, it'll be up to us to see if the models can then make use of that. I hope that answers. Yeah, kind of a, more of an aggregation role than anything else in a lot of ways. Sorry, what was that? More of an aggregation role in, in many ways. Yeah. 